Welcome everyone, I'm Summer Bach. This is Guts and Glory. Today we have one of my favorite people. This is Andrea Nakayama, and she is from Portland, Oregon. We had an opportunity to be living in the same town for quite a while, got to hang out. I really got to know this woman who I want to introduce you to. She is the owner and founder of Replenish PDX, which is an amazing health and wellness company. People go there to help figure out their health challenges, um, and I know that Andrea works with people who are, you know, basically going to find her as the last resort, you know, and then there are people who aren't going as the last resort who go and figure out their stuff quickly and easily because she is so talented and smart as a functional nutritionist. She puts this whole perspective of, you know, what's going on in the body, uh, you know, like what's actually not working and figuring out what you need to do to get things right for yourself. And then for practitioners, she started this amazing school, essentially. Do you call it a school? I yeah. do, yeah. And yeah, she started the Holistic Nutrition Lab, and it's an incredible program, and I can't wait. We're going to chat about that a little bit today. I think we're going to chat about a lot of stuff in the short time we have, but welcome. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks for having me, Summer. It's always fun to hang out with you. Yay. So um, I guess I want to just hear a little bit from you, it's always good to know your story, you know, like how you, how'd you get started in this? Yeah, good one. Um, it was a long journey, but it really started when my husband, Isamu, was diagnosed with a brain tumor. So he was diagnosed with a really deadly brain tumor in April of 2000, so a long time ago now. And I was pregnant with our son, Gilbert, who you know, Summer, at the time. And um, we just went ahead and did everything and anything. At that time, I was already a real foodie. We were living in San Francisco, really into making good food. I was sort of dabbling in health, but I had a completely different career. I worked in book publishing as a production director. And I switched all of my attention, other than for work, to research and figuring out what we could do in alternative therapies to help him while we were doing everything conventional because he wasn't expected to live to see our son born. He lived two and a half years, so he died when our son was 19 months old and that son, Gilbert, is now 14. He just got accepted to his number one high school. so. That's awesome, but it was a long journey and it took me many years after Isamu died to realize this was my calling and this is where I was meant to be situated and the work I was meant to be doing and I put myself back through many, many years of school to get to where I am now. Mm, wow, yeah, your story is always incredible to me. Um, thanks for sharing it. Yeah, thanks for asking. Yeah, and so, I mean, you started working with people, you know, as like um, essentially taking on clients and working with them with their health challenges. And I know that you take a, a fairly unique approach within the industry. Can you like, wh why is it your approach different? What do you do differently? It's evolved over time for sure. So while I was going back and doing all my post-bac, pre-med, pre-rex, I really thought my focus was cancer. And so I was teaching, co-teaching with a local naturopathic oncologist, uh, Eat to Beat Cancer class. And I was doing the cooking at the time. So this is back in the you know mid-2000s. I'm going through many years of school and I'm cooking and learning. And slowly we sort of started to teach the class together. And then I opened my doors for, you know, health coaching practice after amassing some certifications in 2009. And I don't know that I knew at the time what I did differently. I was just growing really quickly. And I had to think like, what is it that's happened? Why are people coming to me? And through that time, I realized it wasn't necessarily cancer. Maybe it was mental health. I was learning a lot about the gut and the brain. So there was this really organic evolution. And I think to answer your question, Summer, I didn't really know what I did differently until I brought more nutritionists on my team. So I now have seven nutritionists on the Replenish team and started to teach in Holistic Nutrition Lab. And as I was teaching, I was seeing with the students what I thought they were coming for versus what I saw they weren't, they didn't have 
and why they weren't successful. So there was definitely the piece, or not as successful as they wanted to be, I should say. So there was definitely the physiological piece I thought I was the lead leading with, like what's going on in there, but there was this whole other piece of the puzzle, which I now call the art of the functional practice. So what I teach and what I practice is what I call the science and the art of the functional practice and how they go together. What is functional nutrition? So functional nutrition is in the realm of functional medicine and the functional medicine model really looks for the root cause. So instead of just addressing uh, signs and symptoms or not understanding the whole picture or thinking that everything's just a protocol, we're really honoring the individual. So there's this concept in health coaching and in all of integrative and functional medicine that we call bio-individuality. And I think a lot of times we pay heed to it, like, oh yeah, bio-individuality, got it, now I'm going to work with that protocol. But the truth is that bio-individuality is where it's really at in terms of initiating healing and seeing the whole person and enabling the person, the patient or the client to see what's possible for themselves. So that's really for me what functional nutrition is, is that we're looking at the whole person. But the premises as a core of functional medicine, there are two things. One is that we go for the root cause, so what's underlying those signs and symptoms. And the other is that the patient and the practitioner are in a therapeutic relationship. And when I saw that phrase in the premises of functional medicine, I realized that's what I do. I actually enable the patient to be the partner because we've become a culture where we hand over our health to a medical practitioner. And the truth is, if they're doing the work to be a partner, we do too. And we will all be patients, whether we're patients now, we know a patient, we work with patients, you know, whether whatever we call them, they are in their lives patients. How is it that that person is empowered in their medical relationship and not just passive? Beautiful. Yeah. So today's podcast is really for both practitioners and for people who are seeking help. So that's just to be really clear with all of y'all watching or listening. This is just um, an opportunity for you to kind of hear a little bit more about some of what happens with practitioners. Because a lot of times I'm talking to both. But you are, you know, we both run these programs where we're, you know, helping practitioners become better uh, at what they do. And so actually I'm really excited and I know a lot of the practitioners who I work with are excited to hear you speak about this in particular because what we do is so different. Um, well, okay, so I think my biggest curiosity is, you know, how do people decide what program to take when it comes to all of this? And that's, I mean, that's like probably the biggest question that I get from people. They yeah. want to know what it was like, all the programs I've taken. How do they decide? You know, what is the path that you recommend for people? I think it really, it's really um, unique to the individual. And I know we all like to learn and we want to learn more and more and more. And I think we have to listen to what sparks something in us. So there are so many different opportunities more and more lately for practitioners out there to learn more and we have to pick and choose and I have a lot of nutritionists on my own team and in my training that have done other trainings and um, every you can learn more tools you can learn functional diagnostics, you can learn certain kinds of therapies, you can learn specifically about endocrine health, you can learn specifics. I really believe that what makes us successful is shifting our mindset about how we think. And I use physiology as a tool to help us understand what's happening with somebody, but it's only one piece. So um, in a course that I taught called Reframe Nutrition, three frameworks to assess client and patient care, I break my philosophy down a little bit more. And that's an opportunity to think about how we shift our thinking. So I call the three frameworks story, soup, and skill. 
And the story is what you might learn when you're doing NLP or doing some therapeutic work where you learn to really dive in and see what's happening for somebody. And um, with story, it there's more to it from a functional lens. And I don't want to run away from us. I know you asked me about different trainings. I think that, you know, it's it's really important to see who you resonate with mm -hmm. and what it is that's calling you. And there are so many opportunities, as you and I know, Summer, to get a feel for somebody's work, to get a taste of their teachings and say, is that speaking to me? Does that take me further with what I personally want to be doing? Yeah, there's so many um, clients that I will talk to who are either seeking a practice as a health coach or wellness practitioner, or they've already taken a number of courses and are still trying to figure out how to become successful at it. There's like something not quite in place for them. Either they don't have enough knowledge or they don't have enough skill um, or maybe even enough confidence in how to like go out and work with people. And something that a lot of people I've noticed are doing is making decisions from a very emotional place uh -huh. about what programs to take and they're right. making it from that place and I'm this is not a critique at all this is how I've decided many of the things I'm doing but I just want to break this down for people a lot of people are like making this decision of from this place of like a, a gut feeling okay I just had a really good feeling about it you know um, and I think that's great but I think you have to as a practitioner or as a you know budding practitioner you have to also look at that part of that gut feeling is the marketing hitting you <laughs> You know, yeah, absolutely. And, and I, you know, it's like, well, the marketing gotcha. And, and that's not a bad thing. If that, pro if that program is speaking your language and it has everything you need, by all means, take it. But I also just think it's really important that people think about, you know, use that. That's great information. It's a great way to decide part of it. But there's also like really thinking about, well, what skill sets are you missing? Right. And I guess this is what leads me back to where I was going with that framework in that um, when we don't match the skill to the person when we're working with a patient or a client, we're violating the person. And that's the same thing for us as we develop wait, our say skills. Say that again, because that's bit, wait, you got you to like expound upon that one. Okay. So what I like to say is that each of those frameworks is true but partial. So when we, and I'm happy to break that down more if we want to get into that, but story soup, which is what I call the physiology and skill, each part is true, but partial. And so if we learn one piece as a, let's say first as a patient, if we just learn skill, like here's the protocol, here's what I do, I have to drink green smoothies in the morning, I have to go to sleep at 10 o'clock, but that doesn't match the story in the soup, it's violating the person. So the skills have to match the entire person and what's happening for them. And if they don't, it is a violation. I'm going to say that's true of the practitioner too. If we just keep seeking skill without understanding the complexity of what we're working with, both in terms of people, um, psychologically and physiologically we are violating the person thinking we are going to just employ a set of skills and so we keep seeking skills because we think it's the answer in the same way that a patient or a client is seeking the next quick fix with a um, you know a pill a protocol a different diet and we all see this as practitioners and if you're a, you know, somebody who cares about your health, you've experienced this. I'll try this. I'll try this. I learned about that. Dr. Oz is talking about this. Whoever it is, that's what most of the books out there are. They are a protocol, and there's a lot to glean from them, but they might not work for you. And that's the same with our skill set as practitioners. So I really believe it's the skills are important, but we have to know how to think on our feet as practitioners. We have to know how to get out of our own way, get out of the information, get out of the protocol, and be with the person who has so much to tell us. So how do we do that? Mm, mm, that's amazing. Can you tell us what the soup thing is? I'm dying to know what the soup is. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, so that's just the way I broke it down. So I have a version of the, I've taken the functional medicine matrix and revamped that um, for the functional nutrition, the replenished functional nutrition matrix. And again, if I talk about story, and I'm what I'm doing here is just looking at things through frameworks because when we don't have a system to work in, it's harder. And that's what everybody's looking for. So if I'm to say to you, you know, the functional practice is not knowing what you're doing until you're doing it. Like that's what it is. That's scary. But if we can think about how do I think in systems or frameworks, it gives us some context. So when I talk about story in functional medicine, those are the ATMs and the ATMs are the antecedents, the triggers, and the mediators. And I really teach like, what are those and what do they tell you about your client or patient or yourself? I use these same tools in some of my replenish programs that are for higher level individuals. The soup, which you're asking about, is the physiology. So it's how there's a big web in there that's all interrelated. So if we have GI problems, gastrointestinal problems, how do we see that they could have uh, legs, wings elsewhere in the body? How are they connected to potentially structural imbalances or hormonal imbalances or immune imbalances? Because from that perspective of the soup, there's a lot of ingredients in there, but they're all working together to make one. And we have to understand that physiological interrelationship. Again, if we just look at the story for a person and we get stuck in their story, which a lot of people are stuck in their own story, that's true, but partial. We talk a lot in the art of counseling about how people will come in and go, oh, I tried that, I can't do it. Oh, I tried that, I can't do it. If you just sit in that place of their story, you may not be doing the digging you need to do. Then you have to bring in the soup. And you really have to understand what's going on in there and understand the lens of those interconnections so that you can think appropriately about what the skills are that you need to employ for that person. Mm. That's amazing. I mean, I think that's so clear and really important. I love that you have these like three separate arenas to really look at because in my opinion, a lot of practitioners are... Um, are, are getting really stuck on just one of those areas. Exactly. And then they're like the biggest problem here, and this is the reason I really wanted to talk about this with you, and I want everybody to watch this, like non-practitioners to watch this so they can see how to find the practitioners that are gonna work well with them, like start to learn how to ask better questions, start to learn how to just not feel like you made a mistake and picked the wrong practitioner. It's just like you have to keep going until you find the right fit, you find the right skill level, you know, it, it doesn't matter what realm you're talking about, whether it's counseling or health or it's, you know, like coaching for some sort of sport or like voice lessons or music lessons. It's all the same thing. You just like keep kind of interviewing and working with people till you find the right fit. You know, and I, think that's key. I just want to add to that. Wait oh. one second. <laughs> I'm just going to let the doorbell stop. It's quite a doorbell. Yeah, for real. That's not supposed to happen. I need to put a little sign on that. Yeah, exactly. Recording. Do not ring. Okay. Anyway, keep going. What were you saying? Um, on top of that, I think that we, as as uh, you know, consumers, patients, whatever we want to call ourselves, keeping with the model that you're talking about, about looking for the right person, is not looking for the quick fix. So what a lot of people do is they're hopping from practitioner to practitioner because they're hoping the next person will just have the quick fix it all up. But nobody, for, for what many people are experiencing, and you know, half the American population has some sort of chronic illness these days, and that number is on the rise. And when I use words like chronic illness, and you know, I'm being taught to speak to the media, I'm told people don't know what that means. And in my world, everybody's sick. It's not an acute issue that we go to the doctor for and get a fix. It's stuff that's underlying, like you and I work with in our practices, that needs deeper work to uncover how to bring somebody back into their natural state of balance. And it may be that we learn to live with a little bit of imbalance if we have an autoimmune condition or some sort of chronic condition that isn't just going to get all better 
all on its own. So that's who I'm really passionate about. And that goes back to your initial question about what got me into this, because I saw a very stoic man, my husband, the love of my life, treated like a brain tumor. He was literally treated like a dead man by the physicians who were seeing him. And there was something about that experience that stuck for me and allows me to be in that place of compassion with people who are struggling with their health. And it's more people than we could imagine. And when Oprah Magazine in June had that line about us that we were the last best stop for people who are desperate, it was a floodgate, which, um, you know, it just pains me because I want to be able to help all those people. And that's why I'm on a crusade, a, you know, creating a revolution to create practitioners who know how to be with people in that place of pain and not think that it's their job to just fix it or make it go away right away and then feel like a failure or back out of the situation. I, we get all the clients where the other doctors have shrugged their shoulders. Why are they shrugging their shoulders? Why not do the work? Exactly. Well, and I, I think about this a lot because um, because of my fermentation and certification program and also because I have this other um, c like program where I help basically wellness practitioners figure out how to be better at what they do. I mean, we do a lot of client case studies, essentially. Yeah. We go over them and we bring other practitioners in to talk about that stuff. And it honestly, I think that's one of the best things that um, most of my clients have gone through is this client case study review because mo so many um, health coaches in particular uh, and I would say depending on where you graduated like being a nutritionist um, we have some naturopaths who who go through yeah. this as well um, and then a lot of people who are interacting with people around food and nutrition like personal chefs or massage therapists who right. have never ever been given the opportunity to learn really how to talk to somebody and what you're saying stick in there maybe in a painful spot or sure. whatever like there's there's no there, there's very little skill set around the actual being in there hanging in there having the conversation because most of these practitioners have never witnessed somebody else who's been doing it for a long time actually go through it so the way that we learn is often by example through modeling that's how we learn as kids. That's why children are able to use an iPhone better than their parents because they're just watching and they watch the whole world do it and they just like absorb it because they're just watching. You know, nobody has to say, okay, this is how you turn on the phone. They never have to be told that, you know? Right. And so I, I think that's exactly what's missing in the overall practice with particularly health coaching. And I want to say here, when I say health coaching, that applies to doctors. Totally. That applies to naturopaths. That applies to um, like surgeons, you know, this health coaching aspect, it also applies to health coaches, nutritionists. Um, health coaching is a very specific part of the practice of, of you know, wellness. Yeah. It's the moment where you need to talk to somebody about their habits, about the things that they need to change, and you need to really help them figure out what those next steps are and what they've tried before and why yeah. it didn't work and all yeah. of this. And it's, so crucial to understand how, and I think what you said was really brilliant about story, how to not buy into their story and be able to say to them, here's where I, I see that you could really do some work, some yeah. real work to make a shift. And yeah. then you tell them the honest truth and you say things that are, that are hard to say. And this is what I think is missing from most people's practices because they don't ever learn how to say exactly what's on their mind and say it in a way that can really be heard by the other person. And I, I just, I, I wanted to say that because I know that you're offering a huge solution in this area. But so I want to hear your thoughts on this. I think you're spot on. And every week on my team, my nutritionists bring their cases to me to review. So we have a client review meeting and we also have a nutrition meeting where we're dealing with, you know, getting stuff done, but they often take that time to talk about the art of the practice. And these are the type of questions that come up. And often what I'm saying is be honest, 
when you're when somebody's coming to you and they're in this place where they're saying I can't do that or you know this isn't going to work for me you have to get into the place of really compassionate honesty so I like to train the students that I teach and like you said they're health coaches they're registered dietitians they're physicians assistants they're nurse practitioners they're MDs they're all coming because there's this piece that they want to understand better about how we think and on our feet in a dynamic way and how we work with people and when we're talking about story there's an element that has to be um, what I call uh, detached and that sounds negative, but when we think about it, if you just, you can, everybody can imagine this example. And I actually heard that word in relation to a memoir writing class. And the people who were teaching the class were talking about how if you read a memoir where somebody's still in their mess, you can't read it. Like it's hard to digest. It's hard to take in. But when somebody's done the work to kind of go through that and come to that little bit of an objective place, you can read the most horrific occurrence of somebody's experience in their life. And even when it's not yours, you can feel the humanity in it and connect. It's not just about the story. So when I'm in story with what with my clients and what I'm teaching in what in Holistic Nutrition Lab and to my um, students and with my course participants is how we kind of pull away from the the angst of the story. If we think about this in a Chinese five elements way or in a spatial dynamics sort of way, you know, our heart is here and we should be able to fill up our space. And I can feel it for myself and like to teach people when stuff is in here that doesn't belong here, you know, that's when you can't process it. You can't digest it. You, it's like the food that just doesn't go through. And there's so many analogies that happen in our emotional life that also happen in our physiological life. So we need a little bit of detachment and disengagement. And when I'm going into story with clients or patients, I'm, I'm leading them through that so that they can actually see a little bit more from that global perspective. And like you said so well, Summer, that honesty, like it's not about calling somebody out. It's about being in there with somebody. And as practitioners, you know, John Mackey, who's the owner of Whole Foods, uses this term, which I actually love, which is um, a servant leader. And I really think that as practitioners, it's our job to be in service. We are in service to our clients or patients and we need to lead them. So if that's about being an educator, if, depending on what your uh, degree is, if that's about really being a leader, like you and I are really trying to change the way we think about things, we are leaders who are in service to changing something that isn't working for people's bodies, for the way healthcare is done. And I think it's a brilliant term. And it's really what we should be doing for ourselves too. We should be in service to these bodies and helping to lead them instead of just being at the response of what they're doing. Okay, so I want to talk about one of the other big problems. And then we'll talk about some solutions here. So okay. <laughs> it's not going to just be all problems here. But I, it, the problems, are, I feel like, are what get me all, like, riled up to figure out what needs to shift. And I think that's a really nice approach that people could take on with their own health challenges and everything. It's just like, let's get a little bit riled up about the problem so that we're, we have enough energy and motivation to do something about it. So another one of the problems that I see is with health practitioners across the board. Again, this is from you know an herbalist all the way to a brain surgeon. <laughs> not, I'm not trying to like make a hierarchy here, but it, just in the amount of schooling and things like that, and like accreditations and licensing, those are very extreme, very big extremes. And um, something I see that is a huge problem is the way that people don't know their own limits, their own limitations. They don't understand who they're good at working with. They don't understand when they need to say no to uh, working with someone based yeah. on maybe personality differences or conflict of values. Um, there's so, so really, I'd say the biggest problem that I see is that people 
as the wellness practitioner, do not know how to say no to a potential client when it's not the right fit. And I think that that is extremely detrimental to the entire wellness practices or industry and, and the whole the whole thing. I think it's really yeah. detrimental because here's a story. I was talking to um, uh, I was talking to a fermentationist and uh, in training, and they were talking about how they were. Um, oh, actually, this was on a fermentationist in training interview. So this is somebody who was going to sign up. I don't know if they've signed up yet or not. We're, we're in that. We'll see. But the interesting thing was that they said, um, yeah, I was working with this, like they're a, a health coach. I was working with this client and they, um, they have all these health issues with their gut, like tons of GI stuff. It's been a really big problem for years. They finally had to get surgery. They opened them up and, and their colon just like fell apart like tissue paper. And I was like, how many clients have you had? And they're like, they had barely worked. This was just like in their like single digit, mm -hmm. you know, amount of clients that they had ever worked with. Yeah. And I just said to them, I was like, listen, first and foremost, this is above your head. Yeah. Like the, the fact that like they, I mean, and the reason I said it was above their head is because they were trying to give them herbs and foods and things to help this person who's way past the point of um, of that kind of help in that moment. It's not like, okay, let's try to reverse this right now. You, right. You've crossed the point of reversing it when the surgery has happened and things are falling apart. You now need a whole other approach. Yes. And I just, you know, I was like, this person, you either need to be working with somebody who can help coach you to work with this person, or you need to start working with people who really you're comfortable working with. And, you know, it, I, I hear examples of this all the time where people are working with somebody who is just, it doesn't necessarily have to even be a complicated case. It's just outside of their scope. It could be a religious right. conflict. It yeah. could literally be any small thing. It's outside of the scope and they need to say no. And they also, if they want to start working with those people, need to learn how to be with them without trying to solve it. Totally. So I think my perspective on what you're saying, and I'm in total agreement, is that we need to understand our scope of practice and that sometimes it's saying no. And for me, no will come more with uh, uh, compliance or personality issues where I can't make a dent and oftentimes I can. Um, but I think the answer is sometimes no and understanding our no. And the answer is also yes and. So how is it that we are working to create more therapeutic teams for people? And as health coaches or as brain surgeons, there is a role for you on that team. And the, the, in the best interest of the patient, and I'm just using the term patient here as a term that means like the person, even though I know some of us don't see patients, but for the patient, the best thing they could have is a team that is working together, doing what's in their scope of practice. And this is what I do with practitioners around the country. We work in tandem with functional and integrative doctors, naturopaths. I know when we need to get someone on involved and I'm going to help them find that person so we can create a team. And there are so many physicians that are hungry for what health coaches do when they can speak the language, which I teach them to do, because you have to talk about the physiology and you understand your scope of practice and know how to hold your own space with your own prestige and meet the person with the respect of what they do. So I teach my students never to counteract what a physician on somebody's team is doing. How is it you work with that? If you don't believe it or disagree with it, you're not getting your client or patient involved in that discord, you can have a conversation about it. So how is it we act together and in that way create a really therapeutic uh, platform for people to heal. And in a situation like that, where is it where, that we do what I call backing it up? So, you know, in a lot of cases, we have to be looking at gut inflammation, quieting things down, making things easier on the system. There's a place 
for us in any case, no matter how complicated it is. And the categories I talk about, and this might be helpful in, in understanding scope, is uh, something I realized just recently in talking about our client services, is my sweet spot is dealing with big, big. So big, big means they have a big issue and they've done a lot of work. They've made a big effort. They've seen 10 doctors, doctors whose names we know, big, big. We also do really well in our practice with big little, and those are people with big issues who haven't really started as deeply on this journey just yet, and they are the ones that get better quickly. Then, like you were saying from the get-go, little big is probably like our, you know, it's an easy spot for both of us. It's, it's the people who maybe have some little issues, but they're super in tune, really smart. They know they want to get better. They want to understand more. My teachings speak really well to those people because they want to know more. They want to understand more. Little, little, not my thing. I don't really deal with little issues and people who want to make little effort. To, to go there. And there are plenty of people who can do that with, you know, just cleaning up the diet and making things one step better, not of interest to me personally, so not what I teach or who I work with. But that enables me to talk about scope, which is what you're talking about, to my nutrition team, to my students, so that within our niche, we can find who is it that I find I'm most comfortable speaking to and what's my level of actually being able to affect change within that area. Yeah, I think that's fabulous. And I think the ultimate goal with the practitioners is so they don't have to, I, I think people are saying yes to too many people. I don't, this, I'm not saying the solution is say no to everybody right. and just say yes to a select few, which I think is actually what some people teach in health coaching and things like that. It's just like, okay, start talking to just the tiniest little sliver of people. I don't think that either of those are the solutions. I think that the real solution is exactly what you said, where it's like, learn how to say, here's what I can do with you. Right. And the, and know your practice so well, your scope of work so well, that what you're offering them is very true, it's honest, and it's gonna be really helpful for them. And it's also gonna be really, you know, a continual boost of experience, practice, and confidence for you because yeah. it's within um, what you are doing and you're just getting better at what you do. And I, I think yeah. that's, I mean, when people ask me, like, what has it been that's been, you know, a big co contributor to being successful doing this work, I would say that's the biggest one is just being honest enough to say, this, I'm, I can't offer this for you, but here's what I can do. Yes. And I think, too, just in talking about niche, because we kind of touched on that, yeah. that you and I are two really good examples for the other practitioners out there where the niche isn't a uh, condition. And I think that's a trap that people get in. Like, I only work with thyroid issues or I only work with cancer. And you and I each have a niche that allows for different kinds of issues to come in. And we have a certain lens. So our niche is the lens. And my lens is a functional lens. I am that's how I'm looking at everything from the 14 year old whose labs I have to look at today who has a really rare cancer to the 70 something year old who is, you know, at risk of having her colon removed. You know, there's, it's still the functional lens and those are different. Those could be thought of as different niches. So I, I really just want to say that because I think we get trapped. Well, so I want to talk a little bit more about some of the solutions, too, for people, just so that I don't feel like we leave this with a sense of, like, doom and gloom. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. Like, there are a ton of solutions, and there's and, – and I think the one thing I want to say is there – it's – you can never – some people might disagree with me, but I don't think you can ever get too much knowledge or information, you know? And I think that some people are worried that they're going to like waste their money or their time taking programs. And I have at times judged people for taking too many programs. I admit it. And I've judged myself thinking maybe I've taken too many programs from time to time. But the truth is, is every experience I've ever done, everything I've ever taken, every knowledge that's ever come into my brain, I have later been able to see how useful that was. You know, every experience has been valuable in shaping the overall. And I think, 
I, I just, I really want to say that out loud so that people know that there's not this, like, there doesn't have to be a fear of, like, oh, my gosh, what if I'm getting, like, too much information or something like that, you know, or, like, too many certifications, things like that. I think it's valuable. You just have to keep going until you feel like, really feel like you get something that resonates with you. But I think you can shortcut that if you work with people who are really going to give you the skill set of actually being able to practice and, and start working with people in a, a confident way. So, I mean, I think this is just, I, w I would love to hear, like, so what are some of your ideas for solutions? Even if it's like, you know, t talking about your program and how that works, like, I'm super curious. Yeah, I, I really do believe that what I'm teaching doesn't exist out there. And it's come to that over a certain period of time of being out there and being in other trainings, particularly the really sexy functional medicine trainings that we can all want to um, invest in, which are pricey. And I was just at a functional medicine conference two weekends ago. And I was, as I was sitting there, I was like, oh, I get it. In functional medicine, the dietary stuff is basic and the medical intervention is out of my scope. And that's where they're talking. And this is really brilliant for physicians because they need to know that the dietary stuff matters as well as the medical interventions. And all this other stuff in the middle is where they need to look to us. That's where they need us because they get that it exists, but they don't have the time and it's not in their scope of practice to really sit with their patient and make more than like handing a giving a handout about what they should do with their diet. And we all know that that doesn't work. We know it as individuals and we know it as practitioners. So what I love that I do is, is elevate the practitioner to be in partnership with the patient and with the physician. So how is it that we really step in and step up so that there isn't this discord, like I'm working with my doctor over here and I'm working with my health coach over here, but we're on the continuum together and it all fits into the whole. So I'm really excited about that and what it is that we can do to um, better understand where somebody's health exists on a continuum of support. They need Oftentimes, the people I'm talking about, big, big, or big, little, need the continuum. And they need to know how to do it for themselves. They need to know how to be an empowered patient, which is so much of what you do also, Summer. Taking it home, how do we live with it every day? So the, I want to invite people to who are practitioners to download my free ebook, which they can get at functionalnutrition101.com forward slash summer. And if you come in through that route, we have a little special gift for you in addition to the ebook. So it's functionalnutrition101.com forward slash summer. And that ebook really speaks to what is functional nutrition and gives my uh, intake form, my entire intake form that we use at Replenish, and also provides the top five questions that we ask in uh, that initial client session. So I really believe that what we're doing as health practitioners is like uh, being a journalist. And when we're not going into that journalistic mindset, we're missing the person. So what are the questions that we can ask? And you actually said one of them earlier, Summer, which is what's worked and what hasn't? And what kind of information as practitioners can we glean from that? And as patients, what can we ask ourselves in all honesty when we go what's worked and what hasn't? And really look at that and think about it because there's reasons why things worked and there's reasons why things didn't. And we may have brushed them off or paid heed to one without really considering everything. So that's the way I want to invite people into just learning a little bit more about my philosophy in how we approach uh, functional nutrition and how I really believe this is a revolution that we are on to change the way we do healthcare. And that is first and foremost what I want to invite people to do. Change it for themselves if you are not a practitioner and change it for more than yourself if you are a practitioner. And that all happens by truly honoring the individual really honoring the patient in every case and being able to see them for who they are and what they bring to the table. 
Mm, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. Yeah, I think um, one of the things that I learned recently in my own practice, because I'm always working on my own stuff and my own that's issues that. or my own um, totally. like health concerns, you know. Um, one thing I learned recently is write down the list of your problems, like, you know, your own problems. And I think this is yeah. really important for, you know, those of those people who are sick to obviously write down your list of problems so you know what it is that you're going to seek help for. But also as a practitioner, write down your list of problems. You're not exempt. You know, what right. are you not going to get help and support on? You know, I think that yeah. there's so many practitioners out there who are actually kind of skipping some of their own problems and helping other people a lot and need to take that time and actually help their own bodies and prioritize themselves. And I don't mean to like take that to a side note, but I think that's one of the really important reasons underlying a lot of this skill building and like the, the work that, that needs to happen here is continuing to continually working on yourself. Um, so I mean, that's a little bit of a side note, but you made me think of it. And like physiologically and beyond. I mean, I think you and I both know as uh, business leaders, as, you know, people who are, are, really wanting to affect more people's lives that you have to look at your own stuff whether it's your problems in any area of your life and because you're the only one getting in your way and that's true of getting in the way of our health and that's true of getting in not that it's your fault but there are things that you may not have looked at you didn't turn over that rock and it's like that's the best journey of life like that's why I feel so fortunate to be doing the work that I'm doing because I'm helping other people doing that and I get to do it myself. So I think what you said is really important, Summer, looking at our problems or I call them our signs and symptoms, whatever they are, and they're in all aspects of our lives. Absolutely. Well, okay, so again, what is this website? It's uh, functionalnutrition101.com forward slash summer. And that's where they yep. can go get an ebook. They can get more information about this. They're going to get an intake form. They'll also get five the five top questions they should be asking during an intake. That's super, super helpful stuff. I think that the intake yeah. is probably one of the most crucial parts of that because that's when you're developing trust and really deciding yes. whether you can work with this person or not. Exactly. Exactly. It's all about a really dynamic relationship, and we just need to understand that just like any relationship in our lives, that's what a client or a patient relationship is, and you both get to decide. So who are you showing up as in that process? Awesome. All right, Andrea, we are gonna jump off here, and I think this is a great, this has been an awesome conversation. To me, um, I, I feel like these are the things I think about, and every time we get to talking, I'm like, ah, oh, these are all the things that have been running through my mind for a while now, and it's just wonderful to connect with you, and just continually see that you know not only are we on the same page but just watching our kind of thought process develop um yeah it's a wonderful experience for me but it also means that like the more that we have these conversations the more i'm able to support my clients and i just really hope that this kind of conversation us having this is helpful for people to listen to to really start to understand like some of the things that they're struggling with that they haven't been able to articulate yet Absolutely. I know for my students, it's the juice. You know, it really is like, yeah, it's where we really get to like get things firing in there instead of going, okay, now I've got that protocol. It's like, where do we shift our thinking? So it's always super fun to have these conversations with you. And you said you were going to put me on the spot. I'm still waiting to oh. put on the spot. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, one of these days I'll be Barbara Walters. I'll get you crying. <laughs> Awesome. Well, um, any other things you want to say? Any other invitations or last last thoughts? Yeah, just come join us over on our Facebook pages too. We've got a lot of activity going over there lately. We've got a nice food mood poop challenge going on right now that might be over by the time this airs, but uh, there's always something fun going on. And those are facebook.com holistic forward slash holistic nutrition lab for the practitioners and forward slash replenish PDX, PDX being where Summer and I got to hang out. That's the short, the short version of Portland. So just come join us and hang out. I think, you know, we're, we're your people. Awesome. Thanks so much for being here, everyone. This is Summer Bach and Andrea Nakayama signing out. <laughs>